What is up guys, my name is Bube, I'm a freelance artist and illustrator and in this lesson we're going to be learning how to draw this portrait. I've chosen this painting by John Singer Sargent as our reference because of his ability to translate what he saw in the visual world into something beyond ordinary. So whether you're drawing just for the fun of it or you have aspirations to make portrait commissions and original arts, there's something in this class for everyone. This lesson is geared towards the beginner and intermediate artist with the intention that the skills you acquire here will prepare you to take advantage of the opportunities that excellent portrait drawing affords you. That's all for now, let's get drawing. Whenever I draw a line, I cross-check its length with my divider and compare it to what I see in my reference beside me. In addition to length, angles matter and ever so often I hold up my pencil vertically and horizontally and check to see that my angle breaks are lining up correctly. It's very easy for errors to accumulate work in this way, so you have to be extremely meticulous about every mark you make. Even more so than me, I suggest you start off broader, particularly around the facial features, wait to get their general proportions before specifying the lips or nostrils or the exact shape of the nose. If you look closely, whether I be in the eyebrows or hair, I'm always looking for visual shorthands. The incidence of inaccuracy at this stage of the drawing is pretty high, and so I don't want to overcommit to my lines by spending 15 minutes drawing a specific eye shape. Whenever possible, try to combine the shapes that you see and suggest things that can be better defined with tone later on. See for example, the hair. When I screen my eyes, the shadow shape in the ear, around the left hand side of the neck and lower jaw jump out to me as the darkest elements left in this picture. So before adding our next set of values, I'll block those in with values similar to what I have in the eye sockets and connect them with the surrounding regions. Beyond the nose and neck, in between the eye and nose, and around the chin will be the next set of midtones similar in value to what we have in the nose and forehead. Connect those value shapes in a sort of chin strap all the way to the ear region and blend those tones together. In effect, there are three main value groups in this portrait as you can see on screen. Within those groups are slight variations that make the picture more lifelike. However, in this blocking, we're more concerned with the larger forms and unifying the major value groups to create a cohesive blocking. The white of the paper represents most of the lightest value group, giving us ample room to go darker when we begin our modeling. Like with the previous chapters, I'm starting in the hair. With my darker and softer leads, I work my way through this hair shape, building up the values until they are as dark as I can get them. I'll be ignoring the ornaments in the hair at first, but I'll get back to them once the actual mass of the hair it's better defined. You'll likely be doing a lot more sharpening at this point because darker pencils get blunt faster. If you're anything like me, you're going to be bored out of your mind. But hang in there, resist the temptation to push down harder with your pencil, and in time, this section will be over. This area of the hair is interesting, primarily because of Sergeant's decision to purposely lighten the hair significantly so that it flows better with the overall shape of the face. If you close your eyes slightly, that lock of hair almost melts into the skin. I don't know for sure, but almost certainly the hair was darker in that region, but yet the final outcome is one that is remarkable. With that said, there should be a discernible difference in darkness between that lock of hair and the hair on the rest of the head. My strategy as I approach these locks of hair in the front of the head is to build up the valley first to where I want it, soften the edges around the locks with a lighter pencil, and then go in with my eraser and pencil to create some variety in the shapes. This variety can include extra hair strands, highlights, and negative space. The extra hair strands, by the way, should be thicker than the width of a line. We don't want to be drawing cartoons here. <coughs> Finally, I'm ready to dive into the embroidery in the hair. I waited till this moment because those elements are complicated and much like highlights are not really a part of the form. I've taken some liberty with the shapes here, but I'll try to match the values as close as I can to what I see in the reference. There is some variation, some parts are extremely light, others are much closer to the local value of the hair. I've observed that the darker ornaments have much softer edges than the lighter ones, a difference which must be replicated in our drawing if we are to remain true to the painting. The local value of the eyebrow is about the same as the hair on the head. In addition, it gradates lighter ever so slightly moving from right to left. Don't be shy about indicating some flyaway hair strands here and there, just don't get carried away in doing so. Process is exactly the same for the eye shape. We draw the contours with an eye for making it more dynamic and truer to the reference. The eye can be simplified as a triangle with a slight downward tilt so don't be intimidated by its seemingly amorphous nature. The eye is about as dark as the eyebrows with a similar movement in value going from darker to lighter from right to left. Once I have those two key features established, I'll develop the values in the eye socket such that the contrast in that area is as it is in my reference. In between the eye and nose is this plane of value that is darker than the halftones on the cheek and side plane of the nose but lighter than the darkest halftones on the nose. It's a value shape that can easily get lost 
So I'm going to develop its values now and define its shape. Within that value will be subtle variations. For example, where it meets the eye is a bit darker than everything else. Beyond that, I'm returning to the side plane of the nose, which right now is too light relative to what's around it. Using my 2H and 4H pencils, I'm going to darken that side plane and connect it with soft edges to the value shape surrounding it. The crease around the mouth is very important to indicate as it gives character to the drawing, but also highlights an important part of the form of the face. Often we make it too thin, so make sure there's some breadth to that halftone shape and that you connect it to the values below it later on. Leaving the features for a moment, we are free to elaborate on the larger forms of the face. From the ear all the way down to the chin, we have this passage of tone that's about the same in value and gives structure to the face. I'm going to start building that area up with an even application of graphite and lay the foundation for the modeling to come. Slowly but surely, we are beginning to give life to this portrait. This halftone shape around the side of the face is an important one. For that reason, I've delineated its boundaries with the goal of emphasizing the specificity of its shape and the importance of keeping its edges soft. We must create several layers of value for that halftone shape to appear even and unified and also make the effort to integrate it correctly with ear, hair and the rest of the face. This drawing will be in a state of flux till the end, so certain things that appeared correct may now prove otherwise in light of new information. This lock of hair that we drew earlier at some point started to blending too much with the skin once the area surrounding it was darkened. In response, I've gone back over it repeatedly to darken it to its correct value. This halftone shape around the chin is very similar to the one we just finished working on. Its value is pretty much the same and as such, both should flow into one another seamlessly. Of course, there is some variation in this region. If you look closely, you will see that as the form of the face rolls towards the edges, the values get darker. This change in value is subtle because the forms here turn very slowly. An attitude of continuous improvement and a healthy level of dissatisfaction should keep you returning to areas you have previously drawn to analyze them with fresh eyes. It is the ability to spot errors or parts of the picture that are incongruous that leads to great results in the end. Returning back to the muzzle form of the mouth, I'm going to give a little more breadth to it by darkening the values around the upper lip as well as the crease. The half tones right above are about the same value as everything over in this direction. We just have to make sure they darken slightly as they fade into the filtrum. At this point, you probably realize there is actually not much variation in the values in this painting. That's part of what makes it so unique. The trouble one runs into as a beginner is exaggerating the differences that you see instead of making them as subtle as they actually are. So resist the temptation to make things super dark and then super light. The darkest and lightest elements in this drawing by quite a bit are in the hair. Everything else is a sea of mid-tone. The neck can be very easily visualized as a cylinder, with the values moving from light to dark outward from the center. In this particular neck, we have the shadow to the left, the dark halftones on the side, the mid-tones in the center, and this light band of halftone value at the top. The shapes are already there, the key will be getting their values right, creating the appropriate edges and connecting it all together. While all of the edges are in fact soft, there are levels of softness. The edges here are sharper than the edges there, but softer than those over here. So managing those relationships visually will be the key to accurate representation. Over the next five minutes or so, my efforts will be directed towards developing the cylindrical form of the neck and integrating its shadow shapes with its light shapes. Relative to the focal point of the face, the neck is further away from the light source, so its values on the whole be on the darker side of the half tones we have already established. The lightest planes in the neck we can find along its center, and from there moving outwards, the values get progressively lighter. In the top left hand corner, we have this shadow shape, which is effectively the same value as the other shadow shapes in the face. It blends seamlessly with the dark half tones towards the bottom and the hair at the top. Closer to the face, we have this light strip of value, which is a part of the neck catching a bit more light. I have a visual on screen to give you a better sense of what this value should be relative to the other light planes in this portrait. Whenever we stare at a particular section of the reference, the local contrast in that area increases in our eyes relative to the entire portrait. 
meaning we will have a tendency to exaggerate the differences between values if we fail to compare them to other areas of our drawing. In my mind, this is a jigsaw puzzle wherein I am attempting to fit together different soft but specific shapes. The values in the neck are very compressed, so even as I make my way to the lightest part of the neck, I am cognizant that it can only be so light in comparison to what's around it. I will take my time and layer my values carefully until the level of contrast I see is commensurate with what's in the painting. Also, because the neck is a slow turning cylindrical form, we should express in our drawing a clear gradation from light to dark as we move towards the edges. Each phase of the form must be accounted for by a unified value and the only way we get this is by layering our values correctly and removing areas of incidental value with our needed eraser. Too much incidental value on either side of a plane shift will lead to difficulty in perceiving the difference between the two values. In other words, everything starts to look the same and the drawing flat. Most of what I'm doing now is filling in white spots in the tone to increase the clarity of the values as well as adjust certain transitions that look too abrupt or too soft. I do this to ensure that the indication of my value planes is consistent with the expected fall of light. What we're after is a more or less consistent value gradient. As we travel further away from the light source, the value of the plane should diminish in lightness accordingly. At this juncture, we are free to focus on the details of the painting and bring forward the smaller forms such as I'm currently describing in the chin. In addition, keep your eye out for areas of flatness where the transition between light and shadow is missing a dark halftone, where an edge between halftones is too sharp, or where the proportions look inaccurate. Towards the end, we want to remove the effect of graininess, fine-tune value transitions, and clarify our edges. Making it this far is an accomplishment in of itself, and irrespective of how you feel about your drawing now, you should be honest in your reflection of the good, bad, and ugly. What do you like about your portraits? What would you improve? And how can you carry these lessons into your future projects? Remember to appreciate the little victories, understand that the road to the top is a winding one, and success for no one comes easily. I appreciate you all for coming along for this ride, and I sincerely hope that you leave here with better skills and the confidence to make your dreams a reality. That's all for now. Bye-bye.